It's on. All right. Hey. Hello. You're on? All right. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today on our first live webinar, Catching Falling Knives. My name is Ubaldo Robles, and I am with American Financial Network, based out of the Almond Valley branch here in Modesto, California. No secret that we're in the midst of a market shift. And so today we are going to dive into some commonly asked questions and concerns. Our panel will be discussing the current state of our local market. If now is a good time to buy or sell, what's happening with interest rates in a comparison of renting versus buying. Let's introduce our panel, starting with my colleague, Cynthia Brackett. Hey, Cynthia. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> also joining us today, we have Daniel and Andy Delrell from the Delrell Group. And last but not least, we have Aaron West from the West Experience. Welcome, everyone. It is hey, an yeah. honor to be here. Yes. I, feel like the, I feel like the Brady Bunch, like when, when, when you said hi and then Cynthia said hi, I'm like, what the heck? <laughs> <laughs> I know. Because you guys kind of looked at each other. I'm like, <laughs> Right, I gotta look All right, now before we dive into our first question, I'd like to mention our audience that this will be an interactive webinar. So as we go through our topics, we will post several questions to get your feedback. Uh, if you do have any questions that you'd like for our panel to address, please post them in the Q&A section at the bottom of the screen. Um, starting with the first poll, for those of you that are joining us today, how many of you are in the real estate industry? I'll give everyone a minute to answer that. Can we get the poll up? All right, let me let me get of course whenever we whenever we're doing it it doesn't uh doesn't respond right away but... <laughs> you know let's skip the polls because it seems like they're not coming up anymore <laughs> okay all right no worries all <laughs> right <laughs> all right so jumping in our first question and probably most frequently asked question is a market going to crash what are you guys' thoughts on that uh you know i i i we knew this question was going to come up. So I, I put a little bit of stuff together. You know, it, it's probably the most common question that I think all of us probably get is, you know, are we going to have a crash? Is it like 2007? Are we going to have a bunch of foreclosures on the market? And the reality is, is that we are in a period that's a lot more like the early 80s than we are 2007. And, and here's why. And I, I don't, let me see if I can share my screen here. And as you're talking, Aaron, what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, I'm going to try to launch this this uh, poll. And I, if you guys see it pop up on your screen, uh, participate. We want this to be a bit more interactive. Yes. So, um, so what we are facing right now is actually record low inventory, and this is a, a national picture of what the inventory or what the the number of homes on the market were in 2007 versus today. So if you look at 2007, here we go. Do you think the market will crash? Uh, go ahead and post your post your opinion and then hit submit. And then we'll pull that up in just a second and, and see what all of you think. I, so, I love it. Participation. Look at that. We got 30 plus people that have participated. Already answered. I like it. So we had three point, and this is nationally, 3.7 million homes on the market in 2007. Versus right now, where nationally we have a little bit less than a million homes on the market. So about a third of the number of homes on the market now compared to 2007. Now, what does that mean for us locally here in the Central Valley? We were actually kind of the epicenter of all of this. So we are the ones that experience everything first and then come out of it last. And if you look at this chart, in 2007, we actually had over 10 thousand homes on the market in Stanislaus and San Joaquin County before or right when the market crashed before and then right during the market crash. Right now we have less than a thousand. Another way to talk about it is um, months of inventory. So in 2007 and 2008, we peaked at 20 months of inventory, which means that if you put your home on the market, there were so many homes on the market that it would on average take 20 months to get rid of all the homes that were competitors to yours. Whereas right now we are just right at about two months, two and a half months worth of inventory is kind of where we've been averaging right now. So literally 10%, it's 10 times more homes on the market. And it was took 10 times as long to sell your home in 2007, 2008 than it does today. So 
that's it's kind of a classic supply and demand, right? So we have obviously lower supply and and we do have a bear market in the real estate industry right now. Uh, in in financial terms, a bear market is when you have a 20% reduction in value in the, the stock market, the S&P. When you have a 20%, it's a bear market. We don't have a bear market in dollars as far as how the homes have are going to drop in price, but we have as a bear market in the number of transactions because the Fed has inflated the interest rate, or no, the Fed hasn't done it, because interest rates have, have gone so high so quickly, it has compress the number of buyers who can now qualify. So it's not that we have a ton of homes on the market. We just have fewer buyers that can actually qualify right now. So that's the supply side of things. The, de the demand side of things is a little bit different. This is another slide that just shows every year since 1950s, the United States has built over 20 million homes in every decade. And in the last decade from 2010 to 2020, we only built 5.8 million homes. So that means we barely kept up with just the supply of homes that were going off of the market, the functionally obsolete homes. And, and the other side of that, the demand side of it is this, which is kind of crazy, actually. In 2007, there were 116,000 households on the market. In 2021, there were 129, um, 129 million households. I'm sorry. So you have 14 more million households with 3 million less homes on the market. So what, or total homes to sell. So what that means is that the people that are ready to buy, which right now the, the gen, the millennials, which were born from 81 to 1998 are all coming into their prime home buying ages, which is right now about 30 to 32. And if you look at this graph of 33 year old, 33 year olds today, all you can see is that there are going to be more and more home buyers coming on the market, which again is going to increase demand. Whereas in 2006, 2007, you actually saw a drop in the number of home buyers, which was another reason why we had an oversupply of homes. So with that being said, we're nothing even close to 2007 or 2008. And when you hear that news on the radio or the TV or when you're reading and, and they talk about foreclosures being up 100%, it's all about perspective. Right now, we have the lowest foreclosure rate in 44 years. So if there is a small uptick in foreclosures, it's a 40 or 50% increase. It does not mean that in the big picture, there are a ton of foreclosures. So in my opinion, there... We're we're not in we're not going to repeat 2007 2008 because of the interest rates and and Daniel what did people say you didn't post the yeah, I was going to say what was I'm, I'm sharing them I'm sharing them right now so can you guys see the the results oh I like that oh, wow see, I just talked all this time I would have shortened that by like five minutes if I'd have known that 87 percent of the people thought that the answer was going to be no um, well, the, the important thing is some people some people think and and there's a lot of uh, people on this call that are in the real estate industry as well. So it's good to know why, right? So that way you could educate yourself and, and, and your clients or the people around you, what what the data really looks like. Yep. Thank you, Aaron. So moving on to the next question, uh, from a consumer or investor standpoint, is now a good time to buy or sell? Who would like to address that one? Before uh, well, we get into before we get into that, Aaron oh, had mentioned something about uh, comparing it, it kind of feeling more like the 1980s. Aaron, yeah. do you mind diving into that a little bit more? Yeah, you know, it's it's because the Fed in the 1980s we went from super low interest rates to 18 percent interest rates, and the reason for that was the Fed actually was behind the eight ball. They never really got in front of inflation. They were chasing the fix for inflation, and the difference between 80 and today is that the Fed basically learned their lesson from the early 80s and they have been super aggressive in combating inflation and combating. Yeah, and I could talk a little bit about that with yeah, go right ahead. where they are today. 
you know, when we started oh, the year- Cynthia, I apologize. Give me give me one quick second uh, and, and bear with us, everybody. Before you dive into that, I'm kind of curious to see, because I'm a little surprised, just like Aaron was, and I think the rest of the panel in regards to the answer, you know, do you feel the market is going to crash? 87% said no. I'm curious to see what people think the audience thinks is going to happen with interest rates. So if we could post up a question, do you guys think interest rates are going to stay the same where they're at right now? Do you guys think they're going to go up or do you think they're going to go down in 2023? And go ahead. Sorry about that, Cynthia. Okay. Um, I look mm -hmm. at interest rates, you know, like we started the beginning of the year in January with interest rates in the 3% range and never in my, you know, uh, career, did I ever think that interest rates were ever going to be as low as the high twos, low threes, and then within 10 months go up into the seven to the seven and a half percent. And it's all due to inflation. So inflation controls interest rates. <clears throat> and, you know, a lot of people are like, well, what is inflation? You know, I really don't even kind of know what that is. Well, it's too many dollars chasing too few of goods. It's supply and demand. We have seen this over the last two, you know, 2020, 2021 year. I mean, if you think about it, the car industry, the housing industry, there was no inventory. So people were willing to pay over and above value. Supply was low, demand was high. People were obtaining credit and along with the pandemic and the Fed getting stimulus into the economy. So to stabilize the economy, Due to the majority of the economy is ran on credit, the Fed needed to start to increase interest rates to slow the economy down. So the Federal Reserve has the most influence over interest rates. They set a benchmark rate, which is what large banks lend and borrow money. So the benchmark rate is not what the consumer pays to borrow money. So when the benchmark rate increases, this causes rates to go up like auto loans, commercial loans, credit cards. The reason why the Fed wants to increase the benchmark rate is to slow the economy down. They want the consumers to buy less. So lower rates help juice the economy, which is what happened during the pandemic. You know, people were buying cars, uh, people were investing in new projects, people were buying houses, and higher rates do the opposite. You know, they are designed to slow the economy by dampening the consumer demand. So to help inflation, the Federal Reserve has to hike the benchmark Fed funds rate, and they hiked it six times this year. And starting, you know, I think the last hike was 0.75%. So it took from 0.25% to 4% this year. And so remember, the Fed funds rate is the overnight borrowing rate for banks. It does not directly affect mortgage rates. So what does a Fed rate hike mean for mortgage rates? Well, raising the cost of borrowing on certain items slows the economy down and incentivizes savings. I mean, I think like with the banks right now, I think you can go get a certificate of deposit for like 4%. And because they are really trying to drive down demand and thus curb inflation. So if the Fed is successful in cooling inflation, mortgage rates should decline. And so history proves this during the last rate hikes, right? rate hike cycle for the last 50 years. So that brings us into like 2023. Like what are we going to see in 2023? Well, I follow Barry Habib and, you know, he's always been spot on with his information and, you know, he, he has, I'm going to share my screen. So let me see, let me make sure I do this correctly. Okay, everybody can see my screen, right? Yes. So this yes. is the mm -hmm. Consumer Pricing Index. And so the Consumer Pricing Index is the cost of goods and services. And what the Fed does is they look at what the Consumer Pricing Index did from last year to now this year. So if you look at October last year, it was a 0.6%, but then we see in October had dropped to 0.3%. And that's the reason why we saw a dip in rates in October, of probably about a half of a percent. And so you know, what I'm reading, what Barry says is that he feels that inflation has peaked. And I know the feds are going to meet on the 14th of December. And I think that they're going to do another benchmark uh, hike of like a half of a percent. That's what they're talking about. But Barry explained it really well. He said that, you know, we've kind of just climbed like a, it's like a roller coaster. We've kind of tick, tick, ticked up. 
And then now we're rounding that top portion of that roller coaster in January. And then when the CPI or the consumer pricing index comes in for the next couple months, we're going to start to see these numbers drop from last year, which then tells us that inflation, they're controlling inflation, and we're going to see a, um, a decline in rates. So, so just to be clear, mm -hmm. just so everybody kind of understands, and I, I want to make sure that I understand it as well. So when you're looking at this chart that you have right here, it basically is if you add up November of last year, which is 0.5, December, January, February, March, April, May, you add all of those numbers up and it comes to, let's say, pick a number of 8.5%, okay? And then let's say November of this year, instead of being 0.5, it drops to 0.2. Then the inflation rate would be at 8.2% because it's dropping November off and it's adding the new November. Is that correct? Correct. It's a 12 month average. So, so it's a 12 yeah. month running. 12 it's average. a 12 month running total is how it works. So what the Fed is hoping to see is that November, December, January, that those numbers come in lower than November, December, January of last year. That would correct. be an indicator that they're starting to control inflation, which is what That's they want correct. to see. Is that correct? correct. Yes. Okay. All right. And I just so want to make sure I understood it. Yeah, so what Barry says is he thinks like end of Q1, beginning of Q2, 2023, we should see rates drop into high fours, low fives, mid fives, which would be really great. And so I am really excited for what 2023 is going to bring. Awesome. So staying on the topic of inflation and recession, this can we question get, goes back. Oh, go hey, ahead. Yubi, go can we get the results for the poll and see if those? Yeah, I got them. We got a. Uh... What do we get? Here we go. Can you see it? So it's mixed. Yeah. Okay. Mixed. Yeah. A majority of people are, are agreeing with kind of what you said, Cynthia, and, and what Barry Habib uh, kind of mentioned in regards to possibly going down next year, which is good for the market, obviously. And and quick question too for the people that are in the audience right now is can you see the results of the poll or do we just need to tell you what the results in the poll? You can post in the, the chat um, on the on the side and we'll be able to see it. So go ahead, Yubi. I'm sorry for interrupting. No, no, it's okay. I was just going to redirect the question. I mean, since he was talking about inflation and how it affected mortgage rates, but in regards to the local market, uh, as far as you guys in real estate, how do you think that affects property values? Or how is it affecting property values for that matter? I, I think uh, I think prop, that's that's one of those like uh, very sticky and tricky questions. And, and I saw even on the questions is uh, Leo asked, um, how are we helping families purchase properties in, in a market right now where you have high inflation? Like, what is inflation doing to the cost of living? That's inflation, cost of living, cost of, of uh, going out to dinner, you know, insurance premiums, everything in general is going up. And that's what that's what the Fed's trying to get under control. And some of the some of the issues that we've had, and the reason why we've been really be we're trying to be diligent in educating clients is is um is because they're they've been getting squeezed over the last really a uh, few decades. So what I mean by that is some of the consumers or some of the clients that, that we're working with, there's usually a pain point and they want to get into property because they want to lock in a certain lifestyle. And like Aaron said, the average home buyer right now is 33 years old. If you really think about it, if you're 33 years old, that means you probably have about a decade of, um, of rent. So you've been paying rent. And on average, you see about a 3% increase in rent every single year. Well, when you have inflation going up like crazy, when you have a supply chain issue, like you saw Aaron talk about, when you had a when you have a growing population, then there is less supply and a higher demand. There's more formations of homes. There's more money in circulation. And in the last couple of years, what you saw is an, 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 an intense amount of pressure in rents. And you saw double-digit rent growth. And that stings people. Um, and, and so the 33-year-old has PTSD of saying, look, the last 10 years of my life, all I've known is rent increases. My rent went from you know $1,400 a month to $2,000 a month. And, and I'm I'm tired of that. So it, that's, I think it, it's a more important question is whether prices go up or down, um, that could be answered in saying, well, it just depends, right? It depends on if you're looking at a, a year, two year, three year horizon, a five year, 10 year, a 
an infinite horizon. The real question is like, if, if you if you look at real estate as an infinite game, meaning you need a place to stay, you need a home to stay, whether it's renting or buying, owning or, or renting, then um, that's the true question saying, what's the cost of housing for you today? And is it better for you to buy or not? And can you afford it? Is your income, your, your job, um, can you afford it? Some there's the, the 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 hard part of it is we have a lot of clients that we talk to that just can't afford it right now, and that is the devastating part. They're getting forced into a rental market when rates go up, regardless whether prices is going down or softening a bit. The cost of living is more expensive. You might see it on paper that it drops down a bit, but the cost is a lot higher. So, but so talking on the pressure and pain point of rents. So I'd like to ask a, just a, a question. So for instance, like if, if you're, if you're in the rental market and some of the pain points that we have with our clients is like, they, they don't, they want to lock in their lifestyle. They want to be able to buy a property. They want to be able to pay off a place. They want to have that pride of ownership. And, and a lot of and them have. Daniel, had, when you say lock in their lifestyle, can you explain that? Cause you, you say that, but it doesn't necessarily, I don't know, resonate with, with actually the agents. This is a really good term for you to use with your with your clients and for those of you that may that are listening that are in real estate what does that mean lock in your lifestyle so locking in your lifestyle is is your mortgage right your your living expenses your fixed 30 year mortgage um your insurance your taxes locking that in so what you pay today is relatively going to be about the same in 30 years but your home is going to be paid off so you know for sure what your payment is going to be every month without saying or every year without you saying okay well it's another three percent increase or another ten percent increase like we saw i just got a 30-day notice and i was paying 1500 a month now i'm stuck trying to find a place for 2500 that is a big increase so by what i mean by locking in your lifestyle is just locking in your living expenses on what you're paying for housing uh, in a form of a 30-year mortgage. So um, you're so absolutely right on that. And I'm going to add a little bit as well, too. Uh, one way that I kind of look at it is you're keeping control you know, of your budget and your finances when, when you're buying a house and locking in that lifestyle. You're not giving that control up to a landlord. Just like Daniel said, chances are with rent increases, with the government enforcing you know, the rent control, uh, especially those on, on you know, the housing voucher section eight, there's automatic, you know, uh, increases of rent every single year that are going to be factored in. So locking in your lifestyle, in other words, just saying you're keeping control of your budget. Yeah, and, and investors that own these properties or these big companies, they're forced to give rent increases now because if they don't, then they just lost a lot of value in five years when they sell this property. So a lot of the properties that even we own, we've kept the rents about the same. We're forced to give rent increases or it's going to hurt us in 10 years. So rent control in the same, whenever you're dealing with an, a, a, um, a market where we're talking about housing units and people think, okay, how many homes are for sale? But we're talking about housing in general, like how many units are available for me to live in? And when there's a lack of that, then the the and the demand is high because the household formations, you start seeing this increase of cost. So I'd like to ask the question, for instance, if we're seeing a, if you look at the average over in California, the average rent increases are anywhere between four to five percent over the last 20, 30 years. So just to say, say a three percent increase in rents um, compounded over a 30 year period. Right now, rents are roughly a little over two thousand, say twenty one, twenty two hundred dollars a month. How realistic for, for anybody that's on this, do you think that rents would be, if I said in 30 years, that that lifestyle expense would be five thousand dollars a month? I'd like to I'd like to see what everybody's thought is. So what are your thoughts? The question is, do you think think rents would be over five thousand dollars a month in the next 30 years? Yeah, let's hold on. Let's hold on this one. I want to hear. I want yeah, to hear the answer to this one. So, to think that they yeah. would be five thousand dollars a month. Yeah, and I'm looking at the answer, so I'm kind of surprised by some of the answers because you're like, I know for me, when I saw the five thousand a month, I'm like, you're batshit crazy. There's no way five thousand a month. Like you're nuts. And this is a conversation that we have with even um, even some some people today, like even parents. We talked to parents in the past. We're like, well. I don't, you know, I think they're paying, like the houses are too expensive, but they don't see the pain point of what rent's been doing. And so the biggest, the biggest, um, the, the, the teller of the story is if we had a time machine and we're able to go back. So in the, if we, if we go into the future and say we go 30 years from today, are we going to be 
happy with the decision that we made today. It's a lot easier for us to take advice looking backwards, but it's really hard looking forward. So I still get, I'm still seeing people res, um, respond to this, but let me share it right now. Okay, I'm going to end the poll and I'm going to share the results. Okay, so we have we have 33% uh, okay. of the people said no, and 67% uh, uh, of the people said yes. And I have to tell mm -hmm. you this, that I think the people that said yes only said yes because they knew if you asked the question that 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 yes was the probable answer because I can be totally honest. I was like the first time we had this conversation and you said, do you think rents will be 5,000? And, and I was like, you are smoking crack, dude. Yeah, there is no way picture. that's that's going to happen. So I, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead and, and, and keep no, going. I, I, and that's a good, a good point. I did a training with my team on this and I asked everybody this question and, and nobody thought that rents would be would be 5,000 a month in 30 years from today. And so if I felt the same way, I figured like there's a lot of clients that think there's no way rents would be 5,000. What would incomes have to be? Can people even afford it? And so um, so when we really look at it, we almost have to look in, in, in the past and say, well, you know, what did it look like 30 years ago? Like what advice would we have given ourselves 30 years ago to buy or not buy a home? Rents or the cost of living. And then even going further than, than that. So... I'm going to share. I'm going to share my screen, and then I'll go through a couple, uh, a couple of um, examples. So, if you see my, if you, you can see my screen here, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Yeah. So, it's cost to rent versus a mortgage. So, right now, the rent is about twenty one hundred a month. So, it goes back to three percent increases uh, every year over thirty years. You're looking at you're going to be paying about fifty two hundred and fifty dollars a month in rent. Now, remember. Uh, Rent, you pay it. You don't get it back, right? You don't pay anything off. So, you know, you're looking at, you're spending $25,000 a year in rent. That just goes away. Over 30 years, you, you've had uh, spent, not invested, spent $1.3 million in, in housing. So that's what, when we say, okay, lock in your lifestyle, what does that mean? This is what it means. Like, okay, if your payment is, you know, $2,500, $3,000 a month, it's locked in for 30 years. That's what it's going to be in 30 years. The only difference is you're going to pay off your home, right? So now it's, it's, it's hard. it was hard for me to believe that the rents would go up over 150% in 30 years from today. So, but if I look at, if I, if, if I really get into the DeLorean and say, okay, let's go back in time and, and say, if we had an opportunity to go back 30 years and whisper in our parents' ears to say, hey, look, this is what's going to happen with housing. This is what's going to happen with rent. Just like if, if our future self would come back and tell us and give us advice, our 33-year-old self today, I'm scared about buying a house. Should I be locking in my lifestyle? What does that look like for me? Um, and this is, what it would, this is what it would look like. So if I go back to 1990, rent was, uh, rent was uh, let's go back to, to 1960. You go back to 1960 and, and say, if you're in 1990, you go back 30 years in time. If I told you in 1990 that the rent was $79 a month, that rent would go up by 150% or even 200%, it'd be hard for you to believe, right? For me, I know it was hard for me to believe that the rent would be over 5,000, but there, they would have been wrong. The rent actually went up by 684%. Think about that. What, what if rent today, 2,100, add 684% to that? What would a $10,000 a month rent payment be? Hard for us to imagine. But if we go back in time, you saw it between the 1990 and to 1960. Now, if I go to 1960, the rent was 620 a month, right? It went up to 620. And if I say, okay, what is rent going to do in the next 30 years? Um, you know, the rent went up, the average was 1600 a month, locally it was about 2100 a month. So again, rent went up 238% on on uh, on a 30 year period. So it's easier for us to um, look in the past and say, okay, um, what advice should I give myself? Should I lock in my lifestyle? And it's 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 easier to take advice looking in the back. Like the, the people say the best time to buy real estate was 20, 30 years ago. The second best time is today. It's hard to see that today. The investors, mm -hmm. that's why they're buying certain properties is, is they're like, okay, well, it makes sense right now, but I know in in, in in the rent bumps and in 10 years and 20 years and 30 years, my rent, I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I'm underwriting this at 2,100 a month. Now I'm going to get 5,000 a month. What does that look like when the assets paid off? 
and I'm going to I'm going to interject here. Leave that slide up for just a second, Daniel, because if you look from 1960 to 1990, that period that I said we were most like was the 1980s. And that's when you the last time that we had any serious inflation to deal with in this country. And if you look from 1919 to 2020, we had almost 0% inflation during that time. It was very, very low, 3%, 2% during that whole time period. And still, we had 160% increase. So buying a home today at the front end of this, and we have no crystal ball, but the indicators are that we are going to be facing inflation, not at the numbers necessarily that we are today, but certainly not at 2% or 3%. There's just nothing to indicate that the next three or four years are going to be a 2% interest rate. We are much more likely to see a higher percentage of increase over the course of the next 10 years than we did over the course of the previous 10 or 20 years. I think I think you're right. One of the things that that you touched on is the difference between, and this is why they're 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 trying to catch this inflation thing, is, is we have household formations, we have a lost decade of building, we have a lack of housing units in general. We have um increasing an aging population of 33s that are going in into this market. But the, the the thing I think that is going to be even more important is what happened in the 80s that caused that big increase is, is very similar to what we saw now. The difference is we have never printed as much money as we've printed in the last two years in the, in the history of our country. We have increased our money supply so much. So if you have a dollar, like if you have $10 in circulation, we just doubled the money supply. There's $20 in circulation. So if you had owned one out of those $10, guess what? You own 10% of the money supply. Now you own 5%. So your money's going, this is this is why, like when people say, is it the right time to buy? I don't know. Like it might not be the right time for you to buy if, if you're going to be moving in a few years. Uh, it might, it, maybe you can't. Maybe you have to budget in for five years. I think the, the, thing, the thing you have to really look at is you need to start positioning yourself to eventually position yourself to be able to purchase when it's the right time for you. But the pressure that we're seeing with some of our buyers right now and some of our clients is the fact that they, they've had 10 years of renting or 20 years of renting, and they've had this creep, and it's just not slowing down. And with the amount of money that we've printed, it's not going to get any better. And I would, I would be, I wouldn't be surprised if I saw what happened in the 60s to the 90s happen from the 90s from 2020 to 2050. Like, I want you to really think of that and just say, it might not be today. Like, I don't like, I, I tell my clients, like, don't, don't be, um, you know, don't be discouraged if it's not today. Um, but it, there's no excuse in at least generating a plan, having a conversation with a lender, having a conversation with an agent, there's empower yourself by getting educated. That, you know, I, I, I think that goes back to the question that Louis answered earlier. How are you, how are, how do you help families purchase a home when their incomes are not keeping up with inflation? So uh, I think there's a couple of things. One is putting together a plan because you'd be amazed at how many people come and sit down with Cynthia or sit down with Yubi and they're like, I can't afford a home. And when you actually go and figure out how much you make, and then put a plan together to either eliminate debt or decrease debt, you'd be surprised at how often we're able, they are able to help people get into a home. Um, so I, I think that the, the first step is finding a professional that you trust uh, as a real estate agent and as a, as a lender that you can sit down with and have a frank conversation of like, this is where I'm at. What are the things that I can do to buy a house? And, and there's, there's programs out there. There's there's a lot of different ways to be creative, especially in this market, for for people to be able to get into a house. So it's it's put a plan together, find a trusted professional, and then and then I, sit and, down with them. And if you're a trusted professional on this call, which is, uh, we have a lot of people that registered that are in the industry, this is why we put this on is um, is educate yourself on why you're in the service to help somebody buy a home. You're not in the service of selling somebody anything. You're in the service of helping somebody create a plan and educate yourself on the benefits of, of owning a, a property. There's more benefits of owning property than just locking in your lifestyle. 
yeah. You're, you're you, absolutely Mr. right, Dan, yeah, yeah, Daniel, on, on that. And I'm going to touch a little bit about, you know, the, the benefits of home buying, because there are a lot of real estate professionals on this call, and a lot of them aren't familiar with the, all the benefits. So if you're not familiar with all the benefits, it's hard to, to pass that information on to a potential home buyer, especially the first time home buyers. And if any of you that are that are watching, um, you know, our first time home buyers are in the housing market, you may not know about some of these benefits. Daniel touched on one of them is locking in the lifestyle. You know, and, and locking in your lifestyle, as we talked about before, you're you're containing, you're you're keeping that control in regards to your budget. You know, and at the same time, you could do whatever you want to the house. You know, landlords typically in rental agreements. I know I have them in mind. Uh, I'm going to have certain rules uh, of what they can and cannot do inside of that house. Certain paint, certain colors. Um, when it's your house, you could do whatever you want to it. Um, obviously, if you're doing structural modifications, make sure you do those with the proper permits. Um, just so that you get the value for that down the line. Also, the tax benefits. Tax benefits is the biggest thing, in my opinion, because uh, you're kind of getting into the relationship with, with, the, with the government. And, and by that, I mean you're being able to, to take advantage of some of the, the tax deductions that you have. For those of you that don't know what deductions those are, it's the mortgage interest that you have on your mortgage, as well as some of the the property taxes that you could write off as well. Now it's going to be, you know, different case by case, depending on where you're at and your, and your taxes. And of course we recommend checking with your CPA, um, you know, to see what the benefit's going to look like for you. I could show you a quick example. I do have a spreadsheet uh, that we utilize. I'm going to share my screen here. Bear with me a second. And, and as he's pulling that up, you know, the, the value is, is that when we know this information or you as an agent or as a lending professional or a, a financial planner, when you know this information and you're able to articulate it to your clients, you help them get past the fear that they are facing right now because that's what's preventing people from moving forward in this market is a fear. And when you are able to give them balanced truthful information that allows them to make their the decision that's right for them now you are the professional that you have the ability to be so this is something that you know we use as well go ahead andy definitely and, and thank you aaron for sharing that as well so this is an example that that i typed up uh, with an average price now keep in mind this is more for a first-time home buyer um, you know, average, you know, the price that they're looking at 375 with the interest rates about a 6.3%. You're looking at monthly payments. Now, keep in mind, this is uh, principal and interest, P&I, 2228. Now, I'm going to scroll down here so that you can see the total breakdown of the full payment factoring in uh, property taxes, you know, also the mortgage insurance, um, you know, hazard insurance, everything included. You're looking at about $2,900. Now, if you see, you do have some yearly tax write-offs. Uh, which is the interest. You know, you're paying a lot of interest initially when you're first getting that mortgage. Usually if it's a 30 year mortgage, the first 15 year, you're paying more interest than you are towards the principal. So we want to factor that in, assuming that you're around the 22% tax bracket, you know, you're looking at about a, a deduction of roughly $5,000 on the interest. On the property taxes, you're being able to write off roughly about $1,000. So adding those two together, you're looking at about a total of $10,000 for the year, um, which you're being able to save. So if you're really kind of comparing it, uh, yes, initially, you're going to be paying a little bit more up front on your monthly payment of $2,900. But once you factor in the tax savings that you have on it, really your net cost per month is just under $2,100. Now, Daniel shared with you guys that right now, the average rent is about 2,100. So it still actually is a little bit cheaper based on the purchase price of 375 to purchase a house right now. Now, as we mentioned, everybody's case is gonna be different. Everybody has different scenarios. Long-term wise, it's gonna make more sense uh, to invest into the property. At the same time, you're paying down the principal to the house every single year. As long as you're not utilizing, you know, the house as an ATM machine and taking money out, you're also building up equity. It's like a long-term savings account. You know, that's another uh, benefit of being a homeowner. What a lot of people tend to, to forget about is when you occupy that house for at least two out of the out of five years, and you decide you're going to turn around and sell that house, the profit that you're making on it. Some of it is, is exempt from having to pay any capital gains tax. Now, if you're a single individual, that's $250,000 in profit. Think about that. What can you do with $250,000? For those that are married, 
you get up to $500,000. That's a lot of profit that you could put into your pocket. You don't have to reinvest it right away. And you can go on your vacation, go buy your toys. Ideally, I would say buy some more real estate, uh, build your net worth and build your portfolio. Um, and at the same time, you're going to build your credit history. You know, And by that, I mean having a mortgage payment and consistently making, making that payment is going to strengthen your FICO score. Not only is that going to jump up a lot faster, but it's going to be even easier for you. And I'm sure Cynthia can confirm this. When you go get another mortgage, that carries a lot of weight. When you go so, get another, oh, am I on mute? No. I think, I, think, <laughs> I, was on mute. I was gonna jump in too. You know, one of the cool things, Andy, by the way, especially like just legit being able to say how much money you get back, mm -hmm. in a credit, that'd be nice getting an extra $10,000 back because you own a home, right? From the IRS. So Daniel, let me, ask, let me ask this question. If there is someone on, and I'm throwing you under the bus right now, cause that's what I do. Um, if there's somebody on this that is an agent and they would like, something like that is that something that you would be willing to share that 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 spreadsheet for them absolutely yeah send us send me an email and i'd be more than happy to share it with you you could you could swap out your logo if you want and and use it take it as your own um it's, it's super powerful because look at the remember the the um the chart that i shared it, the sure thing for you in 30 years is you pay off a property and you have this savings tax savings like a partnership and then andy said the capital event too that that if you ever sell you could move that equity to something else or you know take it tax free um, but if you're a renter th the certain thing and this is why it's so important for us to advocate and help our clients is 30 years will cost you 1.3 million dollars in rent that is guess what the tax deduction is for that guess what the return on investment is that zero and so that's why wealth it either ends or begins in real estate. And it starts with home ownership. You get, you get an opportunity to do that. You just kind of really educate yourself. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, think I, I, feel like I've, I feel like I've educated my clients in the sense that they want to start investing, but they really don't have the money to do so. So we do, we, you know, we have that conversation that, you know, they purchase a home as a primary residence, live in it for 12 months, then they can then vacate that residence and turn it into a rental and buy a new primary residence. And so that they didn't even realize that and put very minimal down. So, you know, I, I mean, I feel like people need to definitely be educated on that and take advantage of it. Thank you guys for diving into depth as far as renting versus buying and the benefits of that. And obviously sharing the slides to kind of show the historical trends on that, making sense of it. So um, Andy, you mentioned earlier that we do have quite a bit of real estate professionals on this webinar. So for you guys on the panel, um, I know that you guys all have high producing teams. What are you guys telling your agents to help them be successful? And at the same time, can you share some of your best practices that you've implemented or shared with your teams? Um, I, I'll start with this. And, okay. um, you know, I, I talk to a lot of agents. We've got a really great team and it's hard right now. I mean, it is really, even for Daniel and I, I mean, we've got super high producing teams. We've been through, you know, the 07, 08 crash and sur survived it. And this is not an easy market. So if you're an agent out there and you just feel like, what the hell? You are not alone. I mean, it is, it is very challenging. We've gone through a dramatic shift that just went like this. And it's very difficult because we haven't needed the skills to be successful. Um, in the past really 10 years, the market has been, has had a momentum of its own. And now we've switched to a market where we as real estate agents have to create our own momentum. So one of the conversations that we have on our team all of the time is real estate is a contact sport. And you know, I know Daniel's team is the same way. My team is the same way. We have standards that we've set for ourselves that we meet every single week because we have to be proactive and we have to be the ones that are going out and making those touches and having those conversations with our clients. So if you are a solo agent and you're trying to figure out what's going on and how to, how to make that happen, activity is the answer. Is, is setting standards for yourself of whatever that looks like or finding a mentor or finding a coach and saying, what is it that I need to do on a daily basis to create success for myself? So that's 
that's what we're talking to our team about constantly is what are the activities that we're doing by which we can create momentum and success to get through this market first, and then also to create momentum as this market starts to change and soften up a little bit. Thank you, Aaron. What about the Darrell group? I think Aaron Aaron hit on a lot of uh, good points, and and so this is a skills market. Um, you you went back like really if you think about it, the principles stay the same. We're in the service industry. If you're not in if you're in this business and you're not if your main priority is not to serve, then you're in the wrong industry. Uh, that has never changed, right? But the tactics are now different. Uh, we went from a transactional business to a relationship business. We're back mm -hmm. to it. And that means you have to educate yourself. You have to educate your client. Like Aaron says, it has to be a high contact game. You have to stay in touch. You have to help people through the process. Um, that is that is that's changed, right? And 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 so the tactic of how you approach it is different. But the principle of just a relationship based this based business is important. So if you're an agent, you got to reach out to your clients. Guess what? They're scared right now. They bought a home a couple a, a few months ago, and the prices went down. Reach out to them. Talk to them. Let them know. Look. Even if you bought a home that was that was ten percent higher, and you locked in the best commodity that that you could buy right now, which is a two and a half, three percent interest rate, guess what? You're paying less today than somebody that's buying a house right now. So, you, like, don't be afraid to pick up the phone, continue to make the contacts with your clients because this this is a relationship business right now. And can I tell a quick story? So I, well, of course I can. I'm just going to do it. Quiet, everybody. I'm Wait, telling we mute story. Aaron right now? Let's mute Aaron right now. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in 2010, which was really the bottom of pricing on the market, I, I sold a house that the guy had purchased the house in 1979, and he paid $16,000 for it in 1979. And he remembers saying, he told me, he goes, I didn't know how I was going to make my car, my, my payment on my house. I was, I mean, it doesn't matter when you are all of, all of the clients feel exactly the same inflation hit. He paid his house off in 1987 because the price of everything had gone up so much. His income had to adjust. Everything had to adjust, but his house payment stayed the same. He had it paid off in less than 10 years and then had been living there for 20 years with absolutely no payment at all. So when he went to sell in 2011, I think we sold the house for $116,000. It's 300 and something a day. He was stoked because he had paid 16,000, paid it off and lived there. So the fears that buyers have are the same fears that they've had this whole time, I mean, when the market was going crazy, people were buying out of fear. They were afraid of missing out. So they were paying $10,000 over appraised value. And now rates have changed and they're afraid of not being at the bottom. But at the end of the day, if you qualify and you find the right house, long term, it's an infinite game. You can't help but win. The The government has set it up for our clients to win. Yeah, we Thank just you. we just have to get we just have to get uh, get enough information and skill and and, and get get ourselves educated so we could teach our clients. Some of the things that our team is doing, we just got done with a goal planning session. Mm -hmm. If you're in the real estate industry, Aaron talks about um, the skill set that you need, the, 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 the things that you have to do. I, I, I think I want to say that we all know what we have to do, um, but geez, it's sure hard to do it. Right? <laughs> and even if you make smart goals, it's hard. Like we all know we're going to live with the pain no matter what. We're either going to live with the pain of doing the work or the pain of the decision of not doing the work. And you're not either going to get to build the life and help the clients or you're not. And, and so the only thing that the best and most important real estate right now is from the neck up, you have to get your mind, right. You have to really get your heart, right. You have to make sure you educate yourself and say, look, there's going to be a lot of uncertainty, but the one thing for sure, I need to make sure that my, my, my environment's right. My tribe is right. My team is right. And one of the things that we covered during our goal plan, I wasn't planning on sharing this, but I'll share it just because I think it's super important. And there was a high amount of people that were in this, in the sales industry on this call is Aaron talks about um, goals, having goals. Um, and those are good, but there's, there's, there's different levels of having goals. And I'm going to share a little secret of what we do with our, when people say, okay, why is it that your team can, can produce so much? It's, it's because we have this beauty of not just having goals, but having behavior goals that are measurable, timelined, and then we have 
um, we have a commitment to one another. So I'm going to share. Um, this is this is from um, the American Society of Training and Development. Um, so this is this is one of the um, one of the um, one of the coolest. If anything, you take a screenshot of this because this is going to dictate. You have full control of whether you achieve what you want to achieve uh, next year. It's it's and it's all on this. So here are your here are the probability of hitting goals. If you if you create your goals. Um, you have a 10% chance of hitting your goals. How many on this call have created a goal of losing weight or going to the gym after 30 days getting derailed? Um, if you if you want to increase your odds to 25%, you need to consciously decide you will do it. Um, 40%, you have to decide and 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 uh, decide when you will do it by. You have a timeline, a smart the smart goal process. 50% if you plan how you will do it, behaviors to get me to lose weight, to serve certain clients, to buy a home. What are the behaviors, savings, paying off debt, being uh, do good defense, right? Um, 65% if you commit to somebody that you're going to do it. Hey, Aaron, I'm going to commit to you that this is what I'm going to do. You have a 95% chance of hitting your, your goal if you hold yourself accountable to somebody else. And this is something that our team does Andy did an accountability meeting this morning with, with, with one of our best guys. He does, in a way, you're like, well, you don't need accountability if you're already performing and, and serving so many clients. But you know what? Accountability is breakfast for champions because you have a 95% chance of reaching your goal and the life that you want if you hold yourself accountable to, to, to something. And we don't operate our business on... Uh, doing the things so that way we were able to do these things right, right? I don't, I, my, our goal, our team's goal is not to say, okay, I'm going to make these calls. I'm going to contact these clients until, until I could do it right. The difference of accountability is we do it so much that we can't do it wrong. And that's the difference. It, so many people do it until they, until they do it right and then they're done. Mastery comes when you do it so much, you can't freaking do it wrong. So if you're an agent in sales and this is something that you struggle with every year, I, 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 um, I'll, I'll challenge you to, to dive deeper in that. And, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to break the rules right now because, you know, Daniel's team and my team both, um, have a lot of similarities to them. And the West experience is actually looking for a couple of people to help be more successful right now. So we're, we're actually intentionally adding a couple of people to our team. So if you are an agent and you're looking for that accountability and you really feel like you have the tools to be successful, but just don't have the direction and the tribe to do it with, um, reach out to me. I'd love to have a conversation with you and see if we're the right fit for you and you're the right fit for the West experience. So that was a, 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 a blatant plug. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, as we wrap up our conversation, can each one of you guys please give us a brief response with your thoughts and predictions on the direction of the market as we head into 2023? Go ahead, Andy. Yeah, that's that's a great one. Um, you know, it's obviously it's, it's tough to say, but looking at, the, you know, all the trends and looking at all the analytics, um, you know, with the prediction of kind of what Cynthia had mentioned, interest rates kind of com uh, coming down sometime next year. Um, you know, I think the market is is going to continue to to stay, you know, a seller's, a seller's market. I think we're going to continue to to see many people getting back into into the uh, you know the home buying process, and and you know buying their first home and saying you know what now's the time to do it. Um, I know there's a lot of lenders. I'm sure you guys have probably heard this several times of you know date the rate, marry the house. Um, you know, and and I am I am a believer in that. Cynthia uh, loves that. Uh, <laughs> yep. <laughs> I want to hear Cynthia quote. say it. Cynthia, can you say I it? I that. <laughs> And there are a lot of mixed emotions for it. But, you know, of course, for me, you know, the reason I say that is because the interest rate could be changed down the line when, when interest rates get better. Um, the house, you're going to be there for the next, you know, three, five, seven plus years. Or if you're anything like my parents, you'll be there for the next 20, 30 years. Um, you know, so really it depends on, on your situation. If you're thinking about doing it short term, one, two years, I don't think it's worth your time right now. I would hold off a little bit. Um, if you're thinking long term, you know, more than than two, three years, I definitely think it's time to jump back in. I think that's such a smart way to answer the question is that the, the answer is different for the person. Like if you're playing a finite game, you have a finite time period, then it's going to be different for you than it would be for somebody in infinite period. Right. Um, you just got to look in what's what is it that 
that uh, that you're looking for. And to answer the question for for me, I, I can't add on to anything to Andy because that was fantastic. But um, I think the recession that you're seeing right now is a transactional based recession. Inventory is still low. The months of inventory, in, like Stanislaus County, it actually dropped. Um, what you're seeing is a recession in transactions because of affordability, the rate. So uh, just just know the difference between those. Um, and then if you're the, in the real estate industry, you know that that is going to affect you the way you plan, um, you know, financially for your family and how you're going to uh, serve your clients. So that's just, yeah, I think the recession we're dealing with right now is a lot different. It's called the recession, but it's a transactional based recession right now. So I'm going to come from it uh, from a lending perspective, and I am excited for 2023 because if the mm -hmm. rates do drop, I feel you'll see a lot of first time home buyers come into the market, be able to afford a home they could not afford it in 2020 and 21 because they didn't have the extra money to come in with. They can't afford it now because of where the interest rates are now. My whole career, interest rates kind of stayed right in between the mid fours, mid fives. And if we can get back down to whatever, even mid fives, low fives, that's great. I really feel seller credit has come back in, uh, down payment assistance has come back in. And I really think that we're going to see some new first time home buyers come into the market and be excited about buying their first home. So I'm super excited about 2023. <laughs> well, Cynthia, what about you, Aaron? For those of us in the real estate industry, I think we need to buckle up and be prepared for nothing to really change dramatically through the end of the first quarter. And then if rates start to lighten up, I think that the market will loosen up and we will see a solid, just a solid real estate market where those who are professionals are going to do really well because people are no longer going to trust their brother's cousin's nephew who works part-time at UPS with his real estate license to sell their <laughs> house when when times on the mar when when the times are longer and and there's actual negotiations to do i think that the recession is actually going to last into 2024 but specifically to the real estate industry i think ours is going to be much shorter because the government wants real estate to happen. I think it's 6.8% of the CPI. It's one of the largest pieces of how they they figure out what the, the growth is for the economy. So when they start to want to stimulate the economy again, the fastest and easiest place for them to do it is to make sure that the real estate market is solid. So it just makes sense that we're going to have a really solid next year, as long as there's no, you know, black swans or anything. The, but the, to me, I think that the, the recession is going to last much longer than our recession and transactions that we're experiencing right now. Awesome. So we were going to dive into the Q&A. I think we addressed all the questions. I, I do want to read this comment. This just came through from Leo Swartz. It's a great comment. Uh, he put, God bless you all, and thank you for taking your time to help us out here that have questions. I have clients and agents that one of their main goals is to buy a home or upgrade and buy their dream home. So I'd like to give them sound information and realistic figures. Daniel, thank you for the invite. Relationship business, not transaction business. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. That was a great comment. So, that's, that's all right, guys. Well I think that pretty much wraps I, it I, up. I, unless I you guys have anything one more, else to add. One more thing. I'm going to type this right now, so it might be a little weird. So if you want to fill some space, it's great. I'd like to see Gage 2023. End of quarter, first uh, end of the first quarter. Would you like to see one of these again? And we'll just be the good, the bad, the ugly. We'll tell you what's going on, what we're doing. Um, so um, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and uh, send out a poll right now. And if 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 so, then we will get another one on the calendar. And like I said, we'll it, we'll make this happen because I'll commit to you. We'll set a timeline. And guess what? Hundred percent chance it's gonna happen. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and while you're doing that, Daniel, I'll add a little bit as well too. If there's any topics you guys are interested in that you guys want us to dive into, let us know. Whether it's it's put posting it on uh, the Q and A, sending us an email uh, for mm -hmm. Daniel, you could contact Daniel at Daniel at the Dell Rail Group. For myself, you can contact me at Andy at the Dell Rail Group. For Aaron, you could contact him at Aaron at the West Experience. For Cynthia, Cynthia Bracket, uh, I believe it's C Bracket at AFNCorp.net. Uh, so or let us dot know. Com, dot com. Or dot com, excuse me. Mm -hmm. Dot com. So let us know. We'll customize it. We want to make sure 
that we provide value to you guys. Um, I know one thing that we really didn't talk about this time and we can dive into it uh, if you guys want to see it. a next one in 2023 is affordability, you know, and, and what that looks like right now. I know the California Association of Realtors does a good job of posting them on a quarterly basis. I do track them and I do review them every quarter. Um, we could dive into that as well, too. And, yeah. and too, if you follow Daniel or myself or Cynthia on Instagram, uh, everybody here is posting some really good quality content right now. So follow follow them. So so um, I'll share the poll questions. Um, you know what would be cool to see? Um, some of the, you know, one of the things that really helped our team is whenever we had uh, AFN come in and talk to us about the 2-1 buy down, talk about buy downs in general, helping us to be a lot more um a lot more aggressive with our offers and saving our clients a ton of money. You know, we're, we're buying rates down a percent down. Like it's crazy. Um, that was really good for us. I think it'd be good. Maybe we get into a little more tactical uh, stuff in, in the end of first quarter of what, what our team, what Aaron's team is doing and how we send up the bat signal and, and you guys come in and save, <laughs> save the day sometimes. <laughs> uh, here's, here's the, here's the results for the poll. So I think everybody says, uh, yes, except for they don't want Aaron on anymore. So we'll I don't see. blame. I don't blame. Him. I don't <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I'm the only yeah. one that answered yes. There was just one response. It was mine. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, uh, so I guess we'll, we'll we'll commit to y'all. We'll do it again uh, in the quarter of 2023. We'll address it. We'll go tactical and practical. If there's any questions that you guys want addressed in that state of the market, send us an email. And we'll put it on and we'll, we'll talk about it. Awesome. Kim will uh, put on the Q&A on here that she learned a lot and that she got a lot of great information. So, all right, guys, that wraps it up. I'd like to thank you guys, our panel, once again, uh, everyone that helped put this together. And of course, our audience for joining us today. This concludes our live webinar. We'll see you next time. Goodbye. Thanks for putting this together. Bye. Awesome. Thank you, guys.